Hello and welcome to CIO Perspectives. I'm Sid All, the co-CIO for Private Clients and Damonson Foundations here at Brown Advisory, and I'm joined today by my co-CIO, Erica Padgel. We're excited to have with us today, Lauren Taylor Wolf, co-founder and managing partner of Impactive Capital, a $3 billion active impact investing firm, an external manager with whom we've been invested since 2021. It's particularly interesting to speak to Lauren today as she and her team focus on investing in smaller companies with a value focus, and she does so with a sustainability lens and an approach of active engagement. In a market dominated by mega cap tech stocks and momentum, perhaps Lauren can shed some light on the opportunities to be found elsewhere. Stay tuned after our conversation with Lauren when Erica and I reflect on the takeaways. So, Erica, are you ready to talk some small cap value stocks today? I sure am, Sid. Lauren, thanks for joining us. You know, I think this is a really timely conversation, just given how rate and economically sensitive the small cap space is. But small cap's also been placed in a little bit of a penalty box over the past year. I sure Uh, have. It's been a lot of fun. (laughs) Well, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us on the pod today. As we mentioned before, you're our first external manager guest. So, This is very exciting for Erica and I. Maybe let's start with a bit of your background for our listeners. Can you tell us about your path to active investing in smaller companies? Yeah. So it was a very nonlinear path of how I got here. As a kid, I was always interested in investing in the stock market and business. I watched that movie, The Working Girl where Melanie Griffith was in a pantsuit and I knew I was destined for corporate America after that movie. A classic. It was classic. But I attended Cornell where I was studying undergraduate business and I ran a marketing business there with student agencies. So always really interested in businesses, business models. I was graduating around the dot-com bubble. And so I joined a firm called Diamond Technology Partners, which was a combination of McKinsey folks and Accenture folks and some Harvard Business School folks that were working mostly with the e-toys and Zebra and Amazon, all the dot-com plays there. And it was so interesting to me at that moment of sort of innovation and inflection. But I wound up getting put on an investment bank project at Goldman Sachs. So I spent most of my early years between Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, the Kansas City Federal Reserve. And then I found myself getting ready to go back to business school and joined a family office actually called Sire Capital, where we were three folks managing one family's capital. We turned $100 million into $300 million from 2003 to 2007, all unlevered return on invested capital. But there was one deal there that really got me excited about the type of investing that we do today. And that was the Turbo Chef oven deal. You see these ovens at like Subway and Starbucks. They have very unique technology. They rapid cook bread to keep it toasty on the outside and gushy in the middle. And it was being managed at that point, it must have been 03 or 04, but it was being managed by a team that couldn't quite get a lot of the deals over the finish line. So we had taken a big stake at like under a dollar a share. We put in a new management team from a company, a dental imaging company, actually, that we had backed that was sold. And that team signed that subway deal. The business grew tremendously that first year we owned it. And a couple of years later, we sold it to Middleby, the largest food service company for about $15 a share. So I saw that, wow, we took a stake at under, we owned around 10 or 15% of under a dollar a share. We sold it for $15 a share. Now we can't always underwrite 15 baggers, but that got me really excited about getting our sort of rolling up your sleeves, really understanding a business, really understanding an industry, getting to know management and working alongside them. I really wanted to focus on that type of active engagement, which led me to an amazing firm called Blue Harbor Group, where I spent 10 years and I luckily, fortunately met my business partner, Christian Asmar, focusing on technology, consumer, business and healthcare services. And we always focus on the smaller mid-cap companies. I think that's where active engagement can really add the most alpha. And in 2017, we thought there's a way to build a better mousetrap. And that's when Christian and I left to launch Impactive Mm -hmm. to do things a little bit differently, but still focus on activism, active engagement in the small mid-cap space. Lauren, it's been a really long time since I thought about both the Working Girl movie as well as Turbo Chef. So with that background, how would you describe your investment philosophy? At Impactive, we really think like owners. We ask ourselves, would we want to own this entire business? And if we owned 100% of the business and had to own it forever, what would we do? And that generally leads to our investment philosophy hinging on two key factors. One is business quality, and two is just sort of a long-termism, a long-term approach to the investing. So we're looking for high-quality businesses that can compound themselves through the cycle at a healthy double-digit clip where time is our friend. And then on top of that, which is really just the stock-picking element of what we do, we then try to engage 
constructively with the management teams and boards of those companies to accelerate that compounding, to accelerate the returns. And this part is more art than science, right? It requires engagement. It requires involvement. It requires time and energy and building trust with people. And so, as you may expect, (laughs) because of the amount of time and diligence that we do on each one of our portfolio companies, we have about eight or 12 names in the portfolio at any point of time, and we're actively engaged with all of those companies. And so it requires, I mentioned, a lot of patience, but you know, we believe that patient investors are oftentimes the most rewarded investors. So that's really our philosophy and how we approach each investment opportunity. So a lot of our listeners might be asking the question, eight to 12 investments, and just thinking about your universe, how do you source new investments? We're looking at mostly North American companies between two and $12 billion of market capitalization. There's about 1,600 companies in that universe, and just under 1,000 of them are actually profitable. And my business partner, Christian, and I have been canvassing this universe. We're working together for about 15 years, but collectively, we have over 40 years experience looking at this universe. So we know many of these companies. Another way we like to sort of break down the universe is when you think about the Charlie Munger saying, invert, always invert. Let's think about what we won't do. Because we're so concentrated, our portfolio is not really set up for anything binary. So we're not looking at companies like a biotech or a pharma company where an FDA approval can send the stock up 10x or down 90%. Those we eliminate. We eliminate nothing with too much external, for instance, regulatory risk and nothing which defies the laws of analysis, right? And so this overlaps with the unprofitable ones, but anything where while we believe that the future might be hydrogen, it's probably 30 (laughs) years away. And so we're not investing in like hydrogen trucks that may or may not have revenue in five or 10 years. So that gets the universe really down to like 500 or so companies to select from for our portfolio of eight to 12. And then what we do is we study industries which we're really interested in. We tend to look at companies that have either business model shifting or where there's consolidation. And so like the general strength and leverage that a company has at market as it becomes more dominant, they have more pricing power and that enhances quality and enhances the moat around the business. And then any given year, we're looking at, call it 20 names in depth. And we're really selecting only three names in any given year. Sometimes it depends on the market backdrop. We had one year where we had many exits unexpectedly. There are some years where we don't have as much conversion, but we're underwriting a high teens to low 20% IRR over a three to five year period. And so we're constantly making sure that within the portfolio, we have the highest expected return opportunities at the proper weighting. And sometimes it means converting out but only like three to four names in any given year out of a universe of, call it 500. Eric and I are both excited to talk about some of those individual companies. And I know we'll do a little bit of a dive into some of those eight to 10 companies in a minute, but maybe we could start talking a little bit about the unusual market set up today. By most measures, this is the most concentrated market we've had in the top 10 companies or whatever number you want to use since maybe the nifty 50 in the 1960s. Market commentary is always dominated these days by AI. And so that leaves small caps, which over very long periods of time have tended to outperform struggling a bit. What do you see driving this small cap underperformance in today's market and what might change? It's been fascinating to watch. Just a couple of things. We obviously focus on small and mid cap and value. Themes like AI and Ozempic or the GLP ones have been really driving a lot of momentum in the market. But what's so interesting is AI has driven this growth outperformance against value. And it's currently today at its widest spread since the peak of the dot-com bubble. So March of 2000. If you look in the subsequent years, the subsequent seven years to that, small cap value stocks actually substantially outperform growth stocks by over 100%, with the Russell growth down 30, while the Russell value was up 80. And so today, we really see something quite similar. Year to date, small caps are down 2 3%, while the S&P is up 18. And as you pointed out, the drivers of that performance, the MAG-7, are extremely narrow in terms of breadth. The MAG-7 drove about two-thirds of the returns in the S&P so far this year, and video alone, I think, is about a third of the performance. So just the highest concentration that we've really seen in recent history. And so small caps are now underperforming large caps again by the largest margin since back to the dot-com bubble. And the NASDAQ is actually outperforming the S&P by the largest margin in almost 30 years, surpassing the peak of the dot-com bubble. So we think 
that it's a particularly unique time to look at small cap value looking out over the next call it five to seven years. And just to get very micro in our portfolio, our portfolio at Impactive, we haven't seen these valuations since the depths of the pandemic, which you know were brief. Our portfolio on a weighted basis today trades at about eight and a half times 2024 PE, which is just extremely unusual. You know, we have a lot of double digit, healthy double digit free cash flow yields, and we're pretty excited about what the next cycle holds. It's interesting. There's a lot of conversation right now about market cap weighted S&P 500 versus the equal weighted. If you think about when you and I probably both started our careers, peak tech bubble to now even the equal weighted S&P is actually still outperforming the market cap weighted S&P from that peak because of how valuations were so stretched at the top. But I'm curious, like maybe just a follow up. What do you see as differences in today's market versus then if you feel like you have any insights there. Yeah, I think relative to the dot-com bubble, it's the large cap guys that are driving a lot of the return. Their free cash flow margins are pretty substantial. I think it's a bit of a healthier. There's some speculation, but it's not quite as speculative as in the dot-com bubble when eToys, which may or may not have had a real economic model, you know, was driving the performance. There's real demand, there's real dollars, and the highest quintile of these large cap companies are actually producing substantial free cash flows. They're cycling it all around and they're looking for an end market. But I think that's a reasonable difference to point out. The problem is it just hasn't broadened out to the other you know, 493 companies within the S&P 500. So I think we're going to need to see a broadening out to maintain this type of performance. And then with these small caps, I think the market structure today is just dramatically different. And I'm no expert on this, but when you look at the amount of capital that's flown to passive and algorithms where there's just momentum and trends, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy on the up, and then it's going to be a downward spiral on the down if we start seeing a lot of selling momentum. So I'm not as Mike Green actually does a lot of really good work on this, but the market mechanics in terms of how the ETFs and algorithms are driving things, frankly, is a lot different than where we were, call it 20 years ago. Lauren, we touched a bit on this in the intro. So outside of concentration in market-weighted indexes, one of the arguments that we often hear about small cap companies has to do with interest rates and that smaller companies tend to have more debt, more floating rate. There's greater reliance on capital markets. How are higher interest rates impacting your universe, but more specifically, how are they impacting your portfolio and construction of your portfolio? I'll take the universe first. Actually, empirical research does a lot of really good work on this. But when you look at the uncertainty around rates, going into the year, everyone was expecting four or five cuts and obviously haven't seen that. The uncertainty around rates really has a disproportionate impact on small and mid-cap companies. First of all, small cap companies, like you said, they have a higher debt-to-asset ratio relative to large caps. Interest coverage, when you look at EBIT to interest payments, large caps have like nine turns of coverage versus small caps that have only three turns of coverage on average. And then when you look at the variable debt, 25% of small cap debt is variable debt versus like 5% for large cap. So it's disproportionate impact to small cap earnings. Now, when you take a deeper dive, for instance, looking in our portfolio, our portfolio is comprised of high quality business that have healthy free cash flow generation. We looked at sort of a 1% move in rates and the impact on our portfolio's earnings. And it's only about, call it a 5 to 7% impact on the overall forward-looking earnings of our portfolio. The bigger, however, albeit temporary in our view, impact is really on the trading multiple. So as the rate outlook looked like higher for longer, any smaller company that has over, call it three turns of leverage, disproportionately hit from a multiple perspective. But therein lies the opportunity. So coincidentally, we're seeing a lot of opportunity today in small and mid-cap companies that have manageable amounts of leverage, and really attractive free cash flow yields, some micro healthy high single digits or low double digits because of inorganic opportunities to really consolidate end markets, which we think could be quite interesting. But ultimately, the higher cost of capital obviously has disproportionately impacted the small caps and their trading multiples, but we see it as temporary. Now, I sort of alluded to this, but some of the work that empirical research does, when you look at the highest quintile of earnings across both small and large cap names, 
their free cash flow margins. So these are the highest earners within those two segments. The free cash flow margins are actually more similar than you think. They're about a little over 20% for small cap, around 25% for large cap. So we think that creates an environment where there's been sort of disproportionate selling of small cap companies. There are a lot of attractive free cash flow yielding small caps. And importantly, when you look at just that highest quintile, when you look at the PE multiples of the small caps relative to the large caps, they are trading at the lowest relative PE multiple to large cap also since the dot-com bubble. So that's why we remain really excited about this segment of the market at this point in time. Yeah, and that just reinforces the benefits of investing for quality, particularly in a universe that has a lot more leverage. Going back to capital markets, what about other knock-on effects of the environment today? How does depressed M&A, merger and acquisition activity, impact your portfolio or the particulars that are AI-driven, such as the CapEx cycle? Just quickly, your mention about quality. We get a lot of pushback sometimes, like how can small mid-cap companies be quality companies? And I think people often forget the large cap companies today started somewhere, right? Many of them started in the small and and mid-cap space. And so we want to get those companies before they grow into large caps. But to your point about the knock-on effects of the rate environment today, M&A activity has certainly been depressed. It's well publicized. There's been a significant slowdown since 2023. In 2023, M&A volume was 35% below the 10-year average and declined 15% year on year into, you know, year to date 2024. Deal volumes are still 20% below the 10-year average in the U.S., likely driven by that rate uncertainty, the shaky confidence level in the boardroom, and a prioritized focus on internally true profit margins, so economic EBITDA margins and real free cash flow. On the activism front, what's interesting is about 60% of activist campaigns used to advocate for sales of the company. Over the past year, it's only been about 40% of campaigns pushing for sort of strategic sales. At Impactive, we never go in trying to say, sell yourself. That's just not our approach. Because again, as I alluded to before, the patient investor is really the best rewarded investor. It's a take on the Buffett quote that the stock market is a device for transferring money from the inpatient to the patient. I think actually now as there becomes more clarity around rates and as we roll forward to looking at 2025 earnings, I think we're starting to see a more robust environment for M&A. Before 2022, about a third of our exits were strategics, not by design. Again, we didn't go in saying we have to sell this company. It's just because we're looking for high quality businesses at very attractive valuations, private equity and strategic investors also look for the same thing. But we had sold Care.com to IC, we sold HD Supply to Home Depot, Equinity to Cirrus, Avis to STG. So a third of our exits were, after holding them for a period of time, strategic exits. The rate environment over the past couple quarters has really slowed M&A down. But as we have more clarity and we're starting to see the economic backdrop change, I think once you have a cut, I think we're going to start to see a lot of M&A activity. To your point on the AI-driven CapEx cycle, I'm going to be a little contrarian here, and I hope your listeners don't hate me for this, but there has been billions spent on AI chipset and hardware, and Goldman Sachs is expecting about a trillion in spend over the, the coming years. And I don't want to sound like a Luddite, but I'm just simply hard-pressed to understand where these returns are coming from. Where are the hundreds of billions of dollars of profit that are required to generate an acceptable return on all that spending? Again, not a Luddite. I think AI is incredible when you look at it relative to, for instance, like the internet in the late 90s and early 2000s. I think this is the most magical innovation that I've seen that was like, oh my God, like the internet when you can just like press a button and avoid having to put a stamp on a letter and go to the post office and send it. And it's far more impressive in my humble opinion than crypto or blockchain or metaverse. But that said, what's the killer app? For all this AI, we have yet to find and identify a real economic model, a real breakthrough model or economic use case to justify all the spending. It seems like a lot of these companies are recycling the free cash flow to one another (laughs) before the Mag 7 and some of like the little ankle biters, but I still don't know exactly. I can't see where the returns will be driven. 
Coincidentally, I've read a couple of academic papers on this. I know we're going to get to our call center business in a little bit, but a lot of professors are starting to really question and challenge the magnitude of productivity enhancement and returns. <laughs> it's sort of funny. A lot of the early signs of productivity seems to be in coding. So these guys are sort of coding themselves out of <laughs> marginal benefit, but I'm a healthy skeptic. I think there's a ton of spending. I think they're cycling with the free cash flow and amongst themselves. I think there's been a lot of hype and it still remains to be seen where the economic model is. Yeah, it just seems to be happening very fast. I mean, there's estimates out there that the CapEx change as a percent of the S&P 500, the four tech companies represent about a quarter of that change. And it's just whether it's irrational or not remains to be seen, but it's all moving very quickly. Yeah, I think we've seen some examples, right? I mean, of Microsoft being able to charge whatever it is, you know, 70% more for their co-pilot service. And perhaps there are other upcharges that'll be out there. But it's interesting. There's so much capital being spent in such a competitive way on building out these AI models. Costs are coming down really quickly. Meta's open sourcing their model. We've definitely asked that question on this podcast and elsewhere. It's like, Where will the profits come from of the 200 billion of spend that's going to come from those companies this year? And as you noted, like projected similar amounts the next four years after that. I don't know the Copilot, but, you know, I don't know a ton of people using Copilot. I don't know if it's goals, but also like Adobe and others. I just don't know that you're seeing the type of premium that, you know, in terms of pricing power that we're able to justify all this expenditure. Maybe we'll see it. Let's dive into AI. And there are obviously concerns from some investors that AI will start encroaching on certain business models, <laughs> may encroach on jobs for software engineers as well. But you have an investment in a call center company, Concentrix, that is at the perceived eye of the storm here. Earlier this year, there were announcements from companies like Klarna saying that their AI automated call center agents were replacing live agents. And that was greatly increasing productivity, reducing costs. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your thesis and Concentrics and your views about the threat of AI and maybe the overreaction that the markets had. Yeah, I feel like we could dedicate an entire podcast to this question. (laughs) So I'll try to keep it succinct. Yeah, perspectives after hours, you know, segment. We'll save that for later. Again, AI is very cool. My husband is a brilliant venture capitalist. So he's been toying around the technology for like the past three years. In terms of mid-journey and Dolly, the graphics, what it can do with graphics and writing lyrics and quickly writing, like, for instance, a recommendation letter, it's pretty cool. But again, I believe right now it's way overhyped and really in search of a killer economic model. I'll get to Concentrix in a second, but this is not the first time we've seen an overhype in in a new technology. We saw this in the perceived threat of autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles on two portfolio companies, Asbury and Wax, who have been in our portfolio for quite some time. In 2021, everyone was sure that electronic vehicles would disintermediate all ICE vehicles and commercial fleets. But when you look at the map, there's about 300 million ICE vehicles in the car park. And today, less than a percent, only 2.4 million cars on the road are EVs. Even if they grow 10x in the next 10 years, still only 8% of the car park and very unlikely to disintermediate the install base of business. Plus, you need the charging infrastructure and whatnot. So those stocks went down on this perceived impact to their business from EVs. They both have since recovered handsomely as there was an overreaction. And in 2021, when Mercedes and others were coming out saying 100% of our new cars by 2026 were going to be electric They've now since walked back those commitments because, frankly, the EVs are the ones that are sitting on the lot and not moving much. So let's get to Concentrix. Concentrix is a call center business. It was a discarded spinoff from a tech distributor. Stock was 200 and went down to the low 100s. And we got pretty interested in it. Again, it's a good business. It's capital light, it's a service business with long-term contracts and decent visibility to near-term revenues. There were secular trends to more companies outsourcing customer service to subject matter experts, which is what Concentrix is. It became the second largest call center business where scale matters in this business because large multinational companies want to be able to nearshore, offshore, onshore, and they want someone who's a subject matter expert who can sort of solve all their different customer service needs. But as we were making the investment or ramping the investment in the beginning of 2023, it coincided with the perfect storm of bad news. One, it was when AI was starting to really get hyped up. And in their 10K, they used the words like customer service and BPO. And so you had 
a lot of the sell side investment banks constructing these AI loser baskets and they would go and search in a 10K. And if you had BPO in it or customer service in it, you were automatically included in it. So we were buying the company at like an eight and a half percent free cash flow yield, which we thought was a reasonable free cash flow yield. Today trades at 20, by the way. So we didn't expect that. That was something that we missed. But at the time we were adding to the position, these are businesses that grow, call it mid single digit organically over the cycle. They've always grown, call it five, seven percent. They were over earning in COVID as there were a lot of new startups and a lot of companies that had to ramp up work from home and they were outsourcing customer service offshore as they were ramping businesses. Their growth went to the very high teens. And then end of 2022 into 2023, the growth started to slow down as they were approaching some reversion and getting to normal. And at the same time, they did a big deal. They bought a company called WebHelp for Concentrics. There was a lot of strategic rationale and industrial logic to it. It built out their footprint in Europe where they lacked relative to another public company called Teleperformance. They're basically neck and neck for number one and number two customer service providers. And so the narrative became, oh God, AI is ascendant. AI is killing them. These two companies, growth is starting to slow. They both did transformational acquisitions. Concentrix, the acquisition grew by 50%. And so the narrative became, these are terminal businesses. In a very quick fashion, we saw the company knife down. So the multiple compress more than we ever expected. And today it's really trading like coal. Now, what's so interesting about it, I mentioned my husband's inventor. We brought the CEO of Concentrix into his office to meet the CEOs, of some of his AI companies. It was very clear. Concentrix has a relationships with the customers. They've had it for decades. They do $10 billion in revenues annually to these new startups. And they're the subject matter experts. Only 27% of the business is outsourced today. And so you have the opportunity to increase that you know, outsourcing penetration. On top of that, when you look at, Concentric was only spun out in 2020, so we don't have the data, public data. But when you look at their peer, Teleperformance, which trades in Europe, they've been public since the 1990s. They have been pursuing the same business plan and they've grown in the face of technological innovation. So whether it was the internet when you know everyone thought, oh gosh, we're going to put instruction manuals online and people will no longer need to call customer service or whether it was online chat, people are going to ask all their questions online and you know someone's going to chat back with them or whether there's web help, even the advent of AI three or four years ago, it's actually been around for a while. Everyone thought that it would disintermediate these businesses, but the reality is Teleperformance has been like an 80 bagger and far outperformed the S&P because what happens is they have, there's some percentage that might be competed away in terms of their business or automated. And in the face of all this automation, they automate the 5% of the business that is quote unquote commoditized, but then they're incorporating that automation. They're becoming more productive. They're expanding margins and they're delivering the solution sets. That's what I think we will see. Just to put a fine point on this. This is a company today, again, trading like a coal company. It's 20% free cash flow yield, five and a half times earnings. It's not going away as we've engaged with the company around things like you know structuring compensation incentives and focusing on business expansion. They've actually accelerated. So in the face of all this technological innovation and AI, the first quarter, they grew 2.8% organic. The second quarter, they grew 3.8% organic. They're getting back to that normalized growth rate after the over-earning in COVID. And I think now that there are two large-scale global players, we're going to continue to see that second derivative improving. We think the returns from here are just extremely attractive. So AI has not taken any of their business yet. They have some customers who are trialing AI with them. And we believe, as have been proven in the past, they're going to continue to grow in the face of innovation while continuing to take more share of outsourcing, deliver the innovation productivity themselves, expand margins. And it trades at a really attractive valuation today. Let's get your take on the Klarna release. It hasn't aged quite as well, I think. Even some others have taken shots at the conclusion, but I know you have a take. We did research on Klarna because we were shocked. The tweet that came out was that Klarna was able to was able to enhance productivity substantially, and they thought there was a $40 million profit opportunity by using AI. Now, when you look at Klarna, Klarna is a company, it's VC-backed, it wants to go public. There was some drama in the boardroom. I think they were really trying to control the narrative and get the market psyched about the prospect of an IPO. Because we did research, we got pretty concerned about that was a very aggressive and brash statement (laughs) that the CEO was making. And so we actually found one of the engineers who had designed their chatbot and was using ChatGPT. 
and OpenAI, and we spoke to a number of formers there. And coincidentally, they were spending about two and a half million dollars annually at that time, which is the equivalent of about 250 customer service agents. So, you know, AI is still not quite as economic. It's still quite expensive. It's not like the internet where like day one, they were such economic value. The marginal cost was almost zero to be able to use the internet versus how expensive AI is to run these large language models are to run even small language models. As we were doing work on Klarna, what we learned was that they're spending two and a half million dollars on AI. That's the equivalent of about 250 reps, even if you replace them. Klarna spends $100 million on customer service. It was only two and a half percent savings, assuming you can get rid of 250 or more. And then most importantly, what was described to us was the $40 million of profit did not relate to the cost. It was actually some quote unquote hypothetical math that the senior team had done all around how the marketing and sales benefits would drive more top line growth. So when we heard that, we got very excited and relieved at the same time. And we subsequently ran a survey of about 50 large multinationals across different industries to assess their intent to deploy AI instead of customer reps. And it pretty much was confirmatory to our thesis, which is no one is putting AI in front of their customers today. No one is taking the risk of hallucination or misinformation to the customer. So I think that was a bold and very PR-seeking statement. I don't think it bears any relationship to actually cost savings in reality yet. It certainly may, but not yet. You know, as far as we can tell from our survey research, everyone is interested in trialing the technologies, but they're not willing to put it in front of customers just yet. It's really interesting that point about maybe mistaking the the cyclical effects of COVID for the secular decline that everyone's hoping or expecting is coming, but also hearing the near-term data points of the exact opposite happening in the face. So to what do you ascribe then maybe the continued weakness of some of these companies that, yes, maybe they're in these baskets, but the numbers aren't proving out the thesis? Or you know, yeah. how do you think about what the next catalyst could be for other investors understanding that this secular change is not occurring? Yeah. And maybe also, Lauren, just the free cash flow yield alone. When do investors wake up and say, wow, that's really attractive free cash flow yield at a very depressed multiple right now? I would say it's very hard to be contrarian. This company has leverage, so they leverage to do that web help deal, which grew its business by 50%. But it's not a substantial amount of leverage. And again, it's capital light, services business. I don't know when investors are going to notice, but I do know they will notice at some point. You never can tell when this company is going to generate its entire market cap and free cash flow in the next four years. And it's not, will it trade at one time, Zipata? Maybe. Will it trade at a 80% free cash flow? Probably not. At some point when they continue to throw off, so it's like a three and a half billion dollar market cap company today, they'll generate 600 million of free cash flow today. It's actually 700 million because some one-time integration spending. They'll continue to grow that 750 million next year. And at some point, the market will say, hold on a second. The short thesis that this is a company that's going to be completely disintermediated, actually, it's accelerating top line growth. It's continuing to expand profit margins. They're delivering some solution. And we do this creative thing with a lot of our companies where we'll restrict ourselves from trading it for a couple of weeks and act as a sounding board to them in front of an investor day or a big earnings update that they want to give. And it's a very, for our process, it's extremely helpful because it allows us to be a value-added partner to the management teams. Because right now, like the Concentrix management team, even the board we've spoken to, they're saying, what the heck is going on? They have no idea why the stock trades where it trades. And our only answer to them is, listen, the stock is going to trade wherever it's going to trade. You have to try to ignore that and really just focus on executing the business plan and putting up growth and returns and profitability, and the rest will eventually take care of itself. So I don't know what it is, but I know there will be a point where the market looks and say, hold on a second, maybe we got this wrong. Maybe this is a company that continues to grow free cash flows and compound earnings at a very attractive clip. And I just hope we've convinced them to buy back some shares. So I hope they can buy back enough shares before the rest I was, of the That was going to be my last question was, do they have the balance sheet flexibility to reduce share count and try to drive value that way? But I guess you answered that question. I was going to ask another question just about how often you know acquisitions or an acquisition strategy is part of what you're advising companies on doing or just how important that can be to the growth story of some of these smaller companies. Do you have a 
Quick thought on that. Yeah. Again, it depends on the market. So our whole idea is, listen, if we can find an incredible business that might be misunderstood by the market or mispriced by the market for whatever reason, the goal should be to hold that company as long as possible. And we like to, in various different market environments, these are companies that should be able to compound at attractive double digits through the cycle in various different market environments. When rates were really low and there were attractive opportunities, like something that we did with Wax, as we said to them, and they've been more aggressive in cherry purchase as well, but we said, hey, Wax is a company that has grown through acquisition and diversified its exposure to fuel. They have an amazing CEO, Melissa Smith. We said to her, listen, right now, this is in the heyday when fintech companies were trading at these huge multiples. And they were trading off because of that EV, the perception that EVs were going to disintermediate the economics of their commercial fleet. We said, hold on a second. We think you might have reached at this moment in time. It feels like we're at the point of diminishing returns in terms of allocating capital to M&A. But we're open-minded to it. But here's this amazing asset where you have almost perfect information because it's your asset. It's trading at 10 times earnings. But if you can manufacture the same type of earnings accretion with an acquisition, if you can find a fintech company when they were all trading at like 100 times revenues (laughs) for 10 times earnings, that's going to accelerate growth. Great. But right now, your shares look really attractive. So we should be taking advantage of the market mispricing your company where you have better information than anyone else in terms of the earnings outlook. And she's done a great job compounding earnings at a healthy teens clip. You can get this at a very attractive free cash flow yield, repurchase a ton of shares. There's nothing really as attractive in terms of M&A opportunity. And then when the market changes, we'll flip. So as rates went up and a lot of smaller private companies needed cash, she can then go on offense and pounce. So right now, I think you know there are some other companies that we're engaged with where they are rolling up the end markets and as seller expectations changed post 2021 and 2022, you can get some really attractive assets because if you have a strong stock price, you can structure a very creative deal looking at the private to public arbitrage, which a lot of our companies are looking at. It really depends on the market environment. Asbury is another example. The auto dealer space is like the mother of all roll-up opportunities because that's part of our thesis there is, you know, Asbury is the fifth largest auto dealer in the U.S. today. It started as the eighth or ninth largest when we first invested five years ago. And these are companies where because the consumer expects to be serviced with technology today, there are about 17,000 auto dealers in the US, 85 to 90% of them are privately held. It's mostly held by individuals who are approaching retirement age. They don't have a lot of family succession planning, so they're not giving the auto dealers to a son or daughter to manage. And importantly, because of how the customer expects to be serviced today, they don't have the wherewithal or the resources to invest in the digitization and technology. And so you have sellers who have to sell in order to compete. And you have these publics that can acquire very attractive assets in the private market. And they do have the wherewithal and the resources to invest in technology. And so they are pursuing this huge M&A arbitrage opportunity. We backed Asbury and supported them in a number of different transactions over the past couple of years where they've more than doubled the business, the the fifth or fourth largest auto dealer in the US, I think they're on their way to number one, two, or three, run by a great operator named David Holt. Lauren, maybe switching gears a bit, it's hard to not have a conversation today about the consumer, which has been so strong, so resilient. Part of it's probably due to the wealth effect of rising property values and investment values. But there's growing concerns of softness and weakening in the US consumer today, delinquencies, consumer debt, excess savings running out. What are you seeing within consumer-facing companies? And maybe you can talk a bit about Marriott and Basic Fit. For lower-end consumers, we're seeing macro trade-down effects. We're actually looking at some new consumer marketplace opportunities that have felt the brunt of this and traded off as much as like 60 70%. So we think there are opportunities there. But in general, you mentioned Marriott Vacations. It's one of our newer companies. They are the best known vacation ownership company. Vacation ownership is about $11 billion market. 130 million households in the US, 10 million or about 8% own at least one vacation ownership product. This is where they buy points for the right to vacation, call it any number. So there's like 1,300 properties that they can choose from globally. 
And VAC, which is the ticker for Marriott Vacations, they serve the premium segment of the market where we just reviewed the consumer is pretty healthy. Last year, they had a perfect storm of bad events. We had the give back post revenge travel of 21 and 22. There was a hiccup integrating a rewards program. And most importantly, the Maui fires, which didn't particularly impact any of their properties, but it really impacted their sales and their sales teams and their staff, which prevented them from selling new product and really her profitability there. This caused the stock to trade down about 60% below its 21 peak. It currently trades at about 12 to 13% free cash flow yield. They enjoy somewhat of a sticky customer base. And most importantly, their business is pretty recurring with over half of the profitability coming from management fees, interest on consumer loans, which they securitize to capture a spread, and then the Capital Light exchange uh, platform that they have. And so these are streams of recurring businesses that grow high single digits over time, dating back to like the 2010s. So we feel really good about back and as they start to anniversary some of these more difficult headwinds to the business. We think they will continue to thrive. And then you mentioned Basic Fit. Basic Fit is the dominant low cost gym provider in Europe. The unique thing about Basic Fit is they have a true low cost advantage in that they have a basic gym, it's just weights, some equipment. They have this very unique central command center in the Netherlands where they use technology to monitor every single gym. So they have about 1,500 gyms across Europe of a total base of about 50,000. They are the lowest cost provider. They dominate Benelux and the Netherlands. They are growing most recently in France and also now in Spain. But they have this central command center where they can see all of the clubs. And they only staff the club with one or two people at any point in time. That's relative to like five to seven FTEs at a typical gym. They don't have pools and saunas. Again, very basic. And just with respect to the consumer, they've seen extreme strength. It's a tale of various different geographies in Europe. Benelux has seen record membership growth. It's very strong. They're the dominant player there. They have between 60 and 80% market share in the various countries. However, France which has been the main country that they were building out over the past couple of years, has had the lowest consumer confidence of all basic fits operating countries. There's a lot of political and social issues that have been well publicized, and the company has seen lower membership growth there. And that's caused the stock to come in a little bit as people are fearing, oh, does France have a business model? We believe it does. And the weakness in France, it hasn't been limited to the fitness industry. In February, McDonald's called the market its most challenged globally. Carrefour is a retailer with about four 40 billion of sales in France cited pressure on purchasing power due to inflation. And so for basic Fed, I think it's a temporary situation in France where they're getting there's some macro pressure. I think they'll get their pricing right. And eventually they've spent, I think it's about $700, $800 million to build out their base there. They are the largest player in France. Right now, the market is assuming like zero return on the French clubs and all the free cash flow is coming from Benelux, but they're also growing very healthy and aggressively in Spain. So we're pretty excited about basic fit. And in terms of the consumer and trade down, again, they're the lowest cost provider because they find the lowest rents. They don't staff a ton of people there. Electricity is the third largest cost and that went up 10x, but we're starting to see it come down pretty substantially. So they'll have a benefit there. And they aren't the only gym provider suffering from these inflationary impacts, right, or macro impacts. And so it's only a matter of time before they enjoy the trade down effect from the customer since no one can compete with them on price. So that's what we're seeing with Basic Fit in France and remain really excited about both of these companies. Maybe we could transition bigger picture to the activism element of your strategy. I know we've talked about this a little bit before, just how the flavors of activism seem to have changed. We seem to have come a long way from the more forward letters and big talking of the Carl Icahn era of activism, but we've seen other activists change their tune a bit, be more constructive with companies. What do you see as the environment right now for activism. Maybe you could describe your brand of it and what benefits you see coming from it. Yeah. So it's been very interesting to watch the activism space over the past 20 years. At the end of the day, activist investors are value investors and value, as we just discussed, has trailed growth You know, in this free money cycle. Now, I think that's starting to change and the environment for activism. I mean, let me pitch why the environment for activism, I believe, is going to heat up over the next couple of years. 
smaller companies, which I think are where most of the activist campaigns are, where the most alpha can be driven, they don't have resources like large companies do. So they're not being targeted by investment banks every week. They don't have business development departments or finance and tax specialists. And most of these companies are run by folks who were in operations or marketing. They're not thinking day in and day out about capital alternatives. So they really can benefit from a partner who comes in like we do in a collaborative fashion. Importantly, when you look at the past couple of years, as companies were IPOing or you had more SPACs and more public companies, about two years ago, 47% of the Russell 2000 companies were unprofitable. That was sort of peak and crazy. Now it's about half that has since improved. But there had been a singular focus on growth, and that was what was rewarded. But now in the past couple of years, there's been a much more heightened focus on free cash flow and profitability. And activists can come in and play a really collaborative and value enhancing role there. Plus about 30% of all the IPOs over the past couple of years had dual share classes where founders had voting controls. For technology companies, it was 50%. Now, it's the really unique CEO who wants to engage with shareholders when they can do whatever they want without being checked. I will say we have met a number of pretty amazing CEOs willing to engage who do have super voting control. And that's not a blanket statement. But the dual class shares will sunset over the next three to five years, which create an opening for shareholders to demand alignment and change. There's a new rule out called the universal proxy card, which allows shareholders to vote not just for one slate. You don't just vote for a dissident slate or the company slate. You can actually mix and match directors. And so I think this all paves the way for more active engagement and a better alignment of incentives with shareholders. And that's really, you know, incentives drive economic behavior, incentives drive all behavior. That's really what matters. In terms of the maturation of the activism approach, I think more and more activists appreciate, it really is the Buffett notion, is you want to work with people who want to work with you, who you admire, who you respect, and who inspire you. And so I think people are realizing it might be more efficient and effective to work behind the scenes. I think a lot of people are realizing that business quality is actually what matters most. That's sort of the cornerstone of Impactive's investment strategy. As we launched our business, it was quality, quality, quality. That's like business quality is what matters. And then you can layer everything on top of it. And you mentioned the early days of brash activism. This got people in trouble. A lot of activists in the 2005 to 2015 era, it was take a big stake in the company. Don't tell them you're there. Do your research. Take a big stake. Publish a white paper or publish an article that says the company should sell themselves, should pursue strategic alternatives. In some backdrops, that works, but it's actually in the minority of times. In other times, it doesn't work. And then what do you have? You're stuck with a large illiquid stake in a low-quality business where time is not your friend. And so that really dampened, I think, overall portfolio returns for a lot of activists. And they were short-term in nature. And it's really hard. With brash activism, it requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of time. It can be a huge distraction. It can delay overall value creation. And from my experience, there's a very low return on aggravation. And by the way, there are some very esteemed colleagues of mine at Elliott and Icon that do it, and they do it so well, and they should be doing that. (laughs) But at Impactive, we really prefer collaborative, behind-the-scenes engagement, where influencing and persuading using the substance of our research and our ideas. We say to ourselves and we say to CEOs and boards, we want to stand shoulder to shoulder alongside you. We want to look out into the horizon together. We're going to own your stock, your company for three to five years. How can we make it worth two to three X over that three to five year period? And call it 21 out of 22 of our investments, they all enjoy this very, very, very collaborative approach. We've written private letters to boards But I would say when you can come to the table with really good ideas like we have with Wax and with Asbury and with KBR, they're inviting you to present in the boardroom. We were invited on the board of HD Supply and Avid. And I think the collaborative approach where you can work hand in hand, a lot of the times it drives the best returns is our experience. But there's always one. (laughs) And it's really important to protect shareholder value in your responsibility. It's really important. We are there to ask the tough questions. We are there to protect our limited partners' returns. And if you try to go over the fence, under the fence, side of the fence, you want to knock down a piece of the fence, sometimes you just have to go right through the fence. Lauren, maybe staying on your active approach, how do you think about sustainability in your investment process and how can it be used to drive? profitability, and long-term shareholder return? 
sustainability and environmental, social, and governance levers have always been part of our process. When we set out to launch Impactive, we saw this white space of opportunity where everyone was talking about this, but they were checking the boxes on ESG in terms of risk mitigation. And it's always been part of that fundamental analysis and research. What we thought was, wow, there might be ways where an environment idea or a social idea, and certainly a governance idea, particularly on incentives, can really drive value. And ESG without returns is simply not sustainable. So we see these as untapped tools for value creation. And these were really important factors. The reason we started to focus on this was in our research of companies, we were speaking to former employees, we were speaking to customers, and it was very clear that a company's ability to drive its business and have its purpose align with the value system of both its customers and employees, they were going to be able to attract and retain the stickiest customers, attract and retain the stickiest employees, and also attract and retain the stickiest shareholders to the extent they hit their marks on these items. And so if you do that, you have the lowest customer acquisition costs, the lowest employee retention costs, you have a lower cost of capital that makes you more profitable, that makes you more competitive. Uh, Not only will you be the top player in your industry, you probably have an opportunity to incentivize others to follow suit. So not only have you changed one company, you have an opportunity to change an industry. That will take time. But for instance, in some of our investments, we've seen substantial value creation because of these tools that we've used. So one is KBR, which was an exited investment. We went in and we said, hold on, you have this really unique opportunity to exit some of the more commoditized energy ENC work that you're doing and dial up your green ammonia, blue ammonia. We were invited into their boardroom to present on why allocating more capital, both human capital and financial capital to the sustainability segment was really important to build up to critical mass. We restricted ourselves with that company, helped them write their investor day, helped them tell their narrative and convince the board to allocate more resources to this very important segment. That segment achieved its 2025 goals in 2023. They enjoyed four turns of multiple experience expansion. And so that had a real impressive near-term return and value creation. And it was over a double for Impactive in just two years. So very good return. And Stuart Brady, great company. With Wex, we went to them similarly and said, everyone in the market thinks that electric vehicles are going to kill your fleet business would drive 60% of your profitability. And you're staying quiet. You're not answering any questions. But look, we did this survey of about 150 of these commercial fleet customers of yours. And they're all saying they want one throat to choke. They want unified reporting across a hybrid vehicle or EV or a commercial vehicle. And you have an opportunity to innovate. Here are the five things they want. These are all software and analytical type businesses, electricity pricing and optimization. It costs you a fifth of the amount to charge at 8 p.m. at a charging home depot versus noon at a charging station at an office building. So you have an opportunity to, instead of just looking at it apples to apples, whether you fuel up a vehicle or charge it at a charging station, that implies like a 20% reduction in revenue per vehicle. You actually have an opportunity to innovate and charge for all these other products and services that have better earnings quality to it. And so they're doing it. So we convince them to come out and say, hold on a second, our economics for per vehicle in the world of EVs, and we don't know how we're going to get there, but we know directionally they're coming, is not that we're losing economics. It's actually we're growing economics and the quality of those revenue streams are higher because they're more recurring in nature versus like a one-time interchange on a fuel charge. And so that's how we convince Wex to go and we encourage them instead of making one big acquisition, you should probably place a number of bets to see which technology survives and also A-B test some innovation internally, which they're doing, and we believe successfully. And then on basic fit, just finally speaking about some environmental change, there was a European energy crisis where electricity prices went up 10x, and that was in the second half of 2022. We had a substantial discussion with the management team regarding how they could address the impact of those energy prices and energy costs and profitability. They did some hedging. But then we acted like a sounding board and really thought about ways that they can reduce energy consumption. I think they set a target for 20%. They've achieved like 17% by year end 2023. And these are through things like when they would open a gym early in the morning at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning and (laughs) the heat would be on and then trainers would come and they'd open the window and like these silly things like this where they have certain rules around temperature and cooling and energy use. They're centralizing the controlling of heating, sealing certain windows to monitor the heat loss and energy loss. 
turning off televisions for a portion of the day, all these round the edges approaches that actually have meaningful impact on costs. Today, the energy crisis is in the rear view mirror, but they're still continuing to work on transitioning some of the older clubs from gas to electric power. They're exploring the role of solar panels. So the work didn't happen just because there was a huge spike in energy prices. It happens because these are ways to improve the economic model of the business. And because we're long-term holders, we like to engage on these areas, again, where there's a direct economic driver to an environmental, social, or governance change. Lauren, we usually close our podcasts with things that we're doing in portfolios. Eric and I are probably going to skip that today. I know there are limitations on what you can say when you're building portfolio positions because you're typically owning a big chunk of these companies and building up those positions without it being public. But could you share any areas you're looking at? today for opportunities, sectors, industries, and what does the pipeline look like today? Yep. So there's an extremely robust pipeline today. And I think it's basically what we were talking about, the mispricing in small cap and value relative to large cap. What we're looking at, we're looking at some secular winners that might have been over-earning in COVID. So that COVID bump and the give back of that is really masking the normalized organic growth of the business, the long-term organic growth. We're looking at many companies that we've been looking at for years, but they were not exactly actionable because of the multiple and the return that just wasn't there. So we're looking in sectors such as healthcare, we're looking at some consumer sectors, just given what we spoke about in terms of the consumer being temporarily weak. We're looking at certain industrial end market distribution end markets. So we're very excited We've been racing around the country, meeting a lot of teams. And I think, again, as I open the call, I think the next three to five years are going to be extremely attractive from a return opportunity for small mid-cap value investors. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I know you have a very busy schedule, meeting companies, meeting formers, meeting all sorts of folks in your due diligence process. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So Erica, that was a pretty fun conversation. We went a lot of different places. What are some of the takeaways you took from Lauren? I completely agree. I think that was great. I mean, clearly she's very passionate about the business and has really extensive knowledge. Just a couple quick takeaways. First, we mentioned this in the beginning, small caps in the penalty box. It's clearly been an underperformer over the past year and investors are skeptical. But what I thought was really interesting is that there's a lot of value there. There's a lot of companies that are able to be found that have high free cash flow margins and low multiples and are on sale. And I thought what she said about free cash flow margins in the highest quintile in small cap being very similar to U.S. large cap. Secondly, AI, her comments that the internet had economic value on day one and that cost savings for AI are still yet to be determined and could take a while. And then just a couple quotes. She threw a lot in there, but two of my favorite ones are is when she talked about targeted activism. It's because of the low return of aggravation. I thought that was a great comment. And then secondly, she referred to ESG and sustainability, that ESG without returns is not sustainable. I thought that was great as well. I think we're just so aligned in the way we think about when we're considering sustainability, how is it driving the bottom line? And I loved when she talked about reducing customer acquisition costs, colleague acquisition costs, and cost of capital in driving some of these businesses, but also talked about some of the individual ways in which you're just cutting costs and doing smart things for the business that also happen to have these better impacts, whether it be for the environment or other. I love quality, quality, quality. Thinking about if you're going to be a long-term investor, and we talk a lot about this, having time on your side. These are businesses that are compounding value over time, particularly important, as you say, in the activism segment. You want to be working with companies that want to work with you. But if things go wrong, you want time to be on your side, those businesses to be compounding value. So you're not stuck in a bad business. And I think the observations of just the constructive approach that they take and that we've increasingly seen activists take are really interesting. And I still believe that there's a lot of value that can be achieved by these more active investors who are doing really valuable research that they're presenting to the boards of these companies and can actually change the strategic direction. It's a little bit like private equity and public markets. And I know we have a few others that we partner with externally that take this kind of approach. And just in general, you know, the impressions of the amount of work that goes into building 
a really interesting, concentrated, differentiated portfolio. It's a lot of conversations, not just with the company, but with customers, suppliers, with former employees, et cetera, in order to come up with a differentiated view of what something's worth. Thanks everybody for joining us. We hope to see you next time. As always, provide any feedback. And Erica, been a pleasure. Thanks, Sid. It was a lot of fun. And until next time.